Hi, welcome to Bridge Connection. Today we're in Psalm 48. We're going to begin from Psalm 48. Um, I just hope you're having as much fun as I am and, and it's being as beneficial to you as it is to me to be going through the Psalms verse by verse. We're a third of the way through. And I want to tell you, this time through the Psalms, and I've gone through them many times, I'm relearning some things. I'm re-understanding some things. I'm being reminded of some important truths about God and his presence and his 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 worthiness of praise and just so so many things and i hope that's happening to you too well here in, in psalm 48 uh, it talks about jerusalem uh the the, the Zion, the, the city of god jerusalem was the chosen city of god the place where his divine glory had been most fully put on display because in jerusalem david united the kingdom David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, Solomon built the temple, a house for God's glory. In Jerusalem, Jesus Christ presented himself to Israel. In Jerusalem, he was crucified. He was buried. He was raised, and he ascended back to heaven. In Jerusalem, the gospel of the risen Christ was, was first preached. And it was in Jerusalem that the church that we love today was launched. And to Jerusalem, Jesus Christ will return at the time of his second coming. This psalm, it's a, it's a hymn of celebration. And it strictly focuses on God's activity in the holy city of Jerusalem. God is in the midst of the city of David. And she will not be shaken or defeated by her enemies. She's situated high on the Mount, Mount of Zion, on Mount Zion, a place of immense beauty and special prominence. Jerusalem is the city of God, the joy of the entire earth. The psalmist offered praise to God who dwelled in Jerusalem to protect her. According to the superscription about this, this psalm is really a song. It was a psalm of praise probably sung together with instruments, we're told. Let's pick it up at uh, verse one, okay? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in his holy mountain. The greatness of the city of God, Jerusalem, can be explained only by the greatness of God. It is the Lord who uniquely dwells within, showing his glory in the city. So this psalm begins with the declaration, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His presence makes the city upon the holy mountain, makes it great. Verse two says, beautiful in heaven, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. As an impressive fortress elevated above the surrounding terrain, Jerusalem was, was beautiful in its, in its loftiness. As the joy of the whole earth, it was admired by other nations. Comparable to Zaphon, the, the supposed residence of the chief Phoenician god, Mount Zion was the city of the one true God. Mount Zion was so named because of the ridge upon which Jerusalem was built. Verse three says, God is in her places. He is known as her, or excuse me, God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. Because God was in Jerusalem's palaces, unusually present with her. He was her fortress. He was her safe place. This means God himself, um, not her exterior walls, was Jerusalem's true defense. The strength of her palaces and her fortresses, her, her refuge was the presence of God within her walls. Not chariots, not horses, not ramparts or towers, but God. Verse four, for behold, the kings assembled, they pass by together. Verse five, they saw it, and so they marveled, they were troubled, they hastened away. Verse six, fear took hold of them and pain as of a woman in birth pangs. 
verse 7, and when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. <laughs> Invading kings, they joined forces to attack this holy city, but they'd been defeated. We read that they, have, they fled in terror uh, like that of a woman in labor. They were overcome with intense pain. It says, as, 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 as great as merchant ships from Tarshish sailing the Mediterranean Sea would capsize and be shattered by an east wind, so advancing armies against Jerusalem would be destroyed by God. As we have heard, verse 8, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah, pause, think about it. So God himself makes the holy city secure forever. The Lord God Almighty, literally the, the, the Lord of hosts, you know, we, we read there, that's literally uh, the Lord of armies. The, that's the defender of the city. Verse 9. We have thought, O oh God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple. According to your name, O oh God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Verse 11. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Within the protected walls of, of Jerusalem, Worshippers meditated on, on God's unfailing love in spite of the threats of advancing foreign armies. And I, I thought of that, man. I, that's, that's how much I want to love God. I want to just meditate on his love. And when I think about his incredible love for me and what he did on that cross, what he accomplished for me, I, I want to be like these people and just meditate on, on God's unfailing wall. In spite of the threats of advancing foreign armies, I want to meditate on God's unfailing love in spite of the threats on my life just from living and situations and hurts and pains and all the things we all experience, disease, on and on and on. When defeated soldiers of the healthier nations are focused to retreat back to their homes. Praise reaches to the ends of the earth, we read. Now that is incredible. <laughs> As they report God's victory over them. But more than that, Mount Zion herself rejoices along with the villages of Judah because their inhabitants know and worship God who perform many awesome judgments. Walk about Zion, verse 12, and go all around her, count her towers, mark well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide, even to death. So the psalmist concluded by calling on God's people to consider the lasting security of Jerusalem. They should walk about Zion in order to inspect her, her towers and her palaces. Only then would they discover that her true greatness did not consist of rock or mortar, it was not in human eyes. It's not what human eyes could see, but in God who was forever and ever. This unseen defender would, 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 would be their guide when Jerusalem was under attack. Ultimately, this psalm looks ahead to the last days in the time of the great tribulation when Jerusalem will be surrounded by hostile foes on all sides. When even in Zion's darkest hour, which is still in the future, the last great assault 
on this, on this great city is, is yet to come. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will descend from heaven and return to the Mount of Olives in order to defend his ancient city. Read about it in Isaiah 24, Revelation 14. In the last days, take this very serious, God will provide his greatest defense of the holy city in the second coming of his son, Jesus Christ. Until then, great unrest will certainly characterize the Middle East and Jerusalem will be a city of perpetual crisis. That's truth and that's just the way it is. But we need to understand that God is in control. We, we see nations begin to attack Jerusalem and then we see our nation not standing up as we have always done before and saying we are Israel's ally and we will stand with them against any invading armies. And we didn't do that this last time. We were, they were told they had the right to defend themselves, but we never stood as an ally. But one day, one day they're gonna be surrounded by all the nations of the world. And there's gonna be a battle going on in the Valley of Megiddo. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. It's gonna be the biggest battle of all times. It's gonna be a war that will truly end all wars. It's been said about a lot of wars, but this one will. Because Jesus will show up and the fighting will be over when he shows up. He will declare that this world is his. See, Jesus came the first time as the lamb, the lamb of God to offer himself a sacrifice for many. And he came as a lamb to make himself available to you and to me, to be our salvation, to be our hope, to pay our penalty for our sin. All the sins I've committed, all the sins you've committed were sufficient to keep us eternally separated from God because we've all sinned and fall short of his glory and the wages of sin is death. That death means we would be eternally separated from God. That's, the, that's, that's two deaths. There's the, a physical death when our bodies cease to exist. There's a physical death when our spiritual bodies spend eternity with God or eternity separated from God. And my mind can't even comprehend what that would be like. Because the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from above from the Father of lights in whom there is no variable, there's no shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He doesn't offer you something good and then give you something bad. He doesn't change, it's, it's truth. And when we receive him, he comes into our lives and the sins we've committed were paid for by Jesus, but we need to receive that payment for all who believe on him, all who accept what he's done for them shall inherit eternal life. And so if you've not done that, you need to do that because he came as the lamb to be the sacrifice for you. So receive him if you haven't. Receive him now if you have. Just rejoice. Be excited about his truth. Be excited about his love because it was all about his love that caused him to come. Make a way for us to have an eternity with God. But there's a second coming. And the second time Jesus comes and sets his feet upon this earth, it'll be the time of judgment. And the whole world will be judged. We as believers will go before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be rewarded for what we've done with proper motives. We can receive crowns of certain things that we've done. If we've done nothing, there are no crowns. We give those crowns back to Jesus anyway at some point because we see his love. But we're, we're judged for what we've done and haven't done. And and I don't know exactly how that goes, but it's, it's going to be incredible. I think we're going to see rewards for people that we didn't think were much of an effect in the kingdom of God. 
and those who had a lot of effect in the kingdom of God, maybe not as many rewards because they, they got a lot here on this earth. But that day's coming. That's the judgment seat of Christ. That's like the uh, Olympics judgment seat, getting the rewards for what they've done, we've done. There's also the judgment, great white throne judgment, besides the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne judgment is all those go before him who never received him. And each one of them will say, this is the Lamb of God that died for the sins of the world. This is Jesus Christ, the Lord. And I rejected him. He'll be cast out of his presence forever, separated from him for eternity, where goodness will never have visited. Nothing good will ever happen. It's every good and perfect gift comes from him, like I said, and this will be an existence away from him. So you have a choice. It says one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Even those who mock him today and say they're not intimidated and no problem, I'm telling you, one day, every knee will bow and say, hey, I had a chance to receive him and I chose not to. And every person has a chance to receive him. This may be your day, receive him. He'll make himself real to you. Just simple prayer, Jesus, I'm a sinner, come into my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior and he will. Just make that decision today. Father, I thank you for this time in your word. I thank you for beautiful city of, of Jerusalem, Lord. I thank you for allowing me to go there and uh, spend time there, Lord. And I pray that any of us who have that opportunity again to go or would go for the first time, who have that opportunity, that we would take that opportunity and we would, uh, we would go. But whether we go here while we're here, we will go one day as we come back with you. Because when you come back that second time, Lord, you've already taken us out of this planet, off of this place. You've raptured us into your presence and you brought us back with you. <laughs> We're going to rule and reign with you for a thousand years on this planet. Wow, you're going to show us how it's supposed to be run in the first place. After that thousand years, a new heaven, a new earth. <laughs> We're excited, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll uh, obviously be in Psalm 49. Thanks for being with me.